Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to say that July 27th is not a bad day for the Day of the Cowboy. Cowboys got to be out there if it's 110 or 10 below. So, yeah, it's all the same to them. Anyway, I want to give you a little background on Kyrgyzstan and then uh, the reason that Josh and I went over there. The uh, word Kyrgyzstan comes from the Turkey, Turkic word Kyrgyz, which means 40. And uh, the Persian suffix stan refers to land or land of. I think there are about seven countries that have uh, what I call them the stan countries. And those are Afghanistan, Pakistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. And then the uh, Kurdish people do not have their own country, but they're often referred to as uh, where they live in, um, in that Middle Eastern area is often referred to as Kurdistan. It's, um, I had always, ever since I was an adult, I think, wanted to go to Afghanistan because they had an active and vital herding culture, uh, nomadic culture. And then Russia invades Afghanistan, and the Russians move out, and the U.S. invades um, the country. So it's not safe to go there. And I'd always also wanted to go to um, Mongolia. And uh, Josh and I talked about that quite a bit. And I think it was in the evening when they had, back when the Flying W was still educating people about the Flint Hills, they had a, a day of pasture burning and guests there, and then it was over. We're sitting around talking stuff. And my wife, Kathy, and Josh's wife, Gwen, said, you guys are always talking about going to Mongolia. Why don't you just do it? So Josh uh, did some looking and found that it was a lot cheaper and easier to get to Kyrgyzstan than it was to Mongolia. Mongolia is also a very large country, and Kyrgyzstan is manageable. And we covered most of that country in the two weeks or so that we were there. Anyway, uh, Josh gets on the internet, starts looking up prices and all that, and decide we decide that we're going to go to Kyrgyzstan. Uh, we don't need anything except a passport. A lot of those countries, you have to have visas and all that sort of stuff. It's a rather complicated process. Here, we already had passports. All we needed to do was uh, show up, show them the passport, and we're there. And he also begins to look for a guide and finds this, I forget the name of the guy now, but he uh, guide was a guide that took us around the country. He arranged for us to cover the first half of our trip. Um, I don't know how many miles was that, 30 miles or so, we're going horseback or? Oh, the, the long ride? Yeah. It was about 130 miles. 130, oh, God. <laughs> if I'd have known that start, I'd never made it. <laughs> yeah, we spent, uh, spent a lot of time horseback uh, riding over the countryside. And in the last half, we was in a SUV that this guide only had a driver who was Russian. Uh, Kyrgyzstan, I think, was the last of those Russian uh, countries to pull away and really didn't, they got along with the Russians pretty well as opposed to some of the others. But anyway, our driver was Russian, our guide was Kyrgyz, and uh, they took us around the country in that, in that um, SUV, and we got to do a lot of interesting stuff there. Got to see uh, some horse races, Buzkashi uh, match, and various other things. We'll get to all that. But um, uh, so I was not able to go in, in, with uh, to Afghanistan and still would like to if it ever, that country ever straightens out, but I wouldn't feel safe there. And besides which, I think uh, 
I'm probably past going to these foreign countries and doing a lot of activities. But it was a good trip, and we really learned a lot, and I'll let Josh take over from here. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm wearing ones. Oh. Um, yes, yeah, so I obviously got very lucky in picking my parents, so my, having a dad who wanted to do something like this. But um, <clears throat> you mentioned it, it's easier to get to Kyrgyzstan is one of the reasons we went there. But also the Kyrgyz have the oldest horse culture in the world. And we've been to Argentina and other places with horse cultures to, to see that. And so that really intrigued me. And um, the, uh, the Kyrgyz claim, and Greg, can you go ahead and start advancing? So the graphic on the left there is a hieroglyph. That's kind of the national symbol. And it's a hieroglyph of somebody horseback, and, or they certainly look horseback, and they look to be carrying a flag. The flag is an addition, but the hieroglyph of, the, of somebody horseback is 14,000 years old. Now, the Kyrgyz claim that they've been riding horses 14,000 years. Most, most scientists don't think that's true, I guess, but the Kyrgyz claim heritage to the 14,000 years. And it is where the horse was originally domesticated and where and uh, horse right. culture comes from. That's right. The Scythian yeah. culture that, you know, spread horseback riding across the world was born in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. Yeah. And uh, the guy, oh, can you, there, the guy in the, both those statues, is named Manas, M-A-N-A-S, or Manas, I don't know how it's pronounced. He's sort of the man that put Kyrgyzstan together. Kyrgyzstan means uh, the 40, and that's because he united 40 tribes or 40 families to form the country. And it was, uh, I think he lived in the 8th or 9th century, and they wrote uh, an epic about him. It's the world's lo longest epic poem, half a million plus lines long, and it used to be recited by people who were specialized in it, a couple of women, mostly men, and they would recite this poem. Now think of that. You got a million, a close, a half a million plus lines to remember and recite, and they'd do it. Yeah, it was really cool. We got to hear a recitation of part of it yeah, a part, later in our yeah. trip. They didn't begin, Not all of it. But. They didn't begin putting it in print until the 19th century, and I don't think they yet have the whole darn no. thing in there, yeah. Uh, but it is the world's longest epic poem, and it was strictly oral, as the way Homer's used to be. It's 20 times longer than the Iliad and the Odyssey put together, so it's really quite a... And Manus was epic himself. He, yeah. um, the National Hedro, that's his, they have statues of him everywhere. Um, the Kyrgyz have a little bit of a, a insecurity about the Mongols because Genghis Khan is so famous. But Genghis Khan's mother was Kyrgyz, and she came from Kyrgyzstan. And the Kyrgyz were some of the first people to ally with Genghis when he united the tribes of the, uh, uh, this would be no. about 450 years after Manus. But Manus united the 40 tribes of Kyrgyzstan. Yeah. And he famously, his horse was injured when he was crossing some mountains. And so he just picked his horse up and carried it over the mountain pass. And then got it. So is, it was. Is the hand printed right or slide? And then, yeah, the next we'll slide. We'll see that. I mean, the that's guy. supposedly his actual hand print carved in rock. And you can see that's my hand. I have fairly big hands. And he was a big dude. But. I mean, yeah, he was really something. But he begins. Uh, and the epic poem, the first book is about him, second is about his son, the third was about his grandson. But it's over a million and a half lines long. Go yeah. ahead. Um, that next one, please. So we left the, we, at the Capitol, we saw some museums and stuff, and we, we headed out to meet our, with our guide, we headed out to meet our horsemen that were going to take us on this big epic ride and through the country. The Kyrgyzstan is really high. It's up in the mountains. It's, it's uh, the, uh, they're these high mountain lakes. Uh, the Kyrgyz have a lot of sayings about themselves. One is, you aren't Kyrgyz if you don't ride. You aren't Kyrgyz if you don't know your seventh great-grandfather. And um, 
the only thing the world wants from Kyrgyzstan is water because they have all this, they have glaciers and water and it drains into all their neighbors. And um, one of the reasons Kyrgyzstan is still pretty intact, they still have their intact horse culture and nomadic culture is because even when the Soviet Union was, you know, had taken over Kyrgyzstan, um, it was too poor. So they, Russia called Kyrgyzstan its meat locker. So it raised mutton and beef and horse and exported to Russia and exported water and that was it. And so, you know, a lot of other Central Asian countries got really displaced and disrupted by the, the Soviet Union and later other countries because they had things to, to extract, but Kyrgyzstan didn't. The water left on its own and is pretty easy to export sheep and cattle. So Kyrgyzstan stayed Kyrgyzstan a lot more than most countries did. And uh, Mamas carrying his horse over the mountain, uh, Mongols have pony-sized horses. They're full size in Kyrgyzstan. Yeah. So he did not carry a pony over, he carried a full size yeah. horse. They're called horses of the blood or blood horses. And it's where all the seed stock for China and Mongolia and the rest of Central Asia got their The very best horses came from the Kyrgyz, kind of the heartland there in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. And um, the blood horses are named that because they actually sweat blood when they get overheated and stuff. It's just a, a genetic trait that lets them just have a little more stamina because they can sweat blood to cool down if they need to, if they once when they're really exerting themselves. But yeah. they're very nice horses, very impressive horses. And next one. So we uh, we traveled through the eastern half of Kyrgyzstan. Or I'm sorry, the western half of Kyrgyzstan, and um, we got to a national park, and we met our horsemen, and um, the horsemen were. Uh, uh, former nomadic yeah. uh, shepherds who had started up a business much like Gwen and Josie and I did with our Flying W Ranch, uh, taking tourists riding. And so we met them at the uh, Akhtarek National Park and um, saddled up and headed out. And How many horses do they have? Uh, we had uh, 14 horses with us that we traveled with. Yeah. Um, and you can go ahead and roll through a few of these slides. But um, this is the, where we started out. There were a lot of little homesteads with milk cows and donkeys and things like that. And then as we got further away, we found it got wilder and wilder. But here's a nice example of horses. Uh, the little sorrel horse is the one I rode most of the time. And this was our, the head horseman, um, Chirmash's horse was, a, they call sport horses, uh, big like thoroughbred type horses. And that was a harvest of berries there. And these are just examples of other horses. The horse on the right is the horse my dad rode most of the time. And um, they're tough little boogers. And the saddles, if you notice, the saddles were just horrendous. Um, the Kyrgyz are very poor. Those saddles, they're, they're serpent head saddles. And I have an example on a horse outside that when we get done, just I'll try to get Josie to ride him over here and everybody can look at the, sat, the serpent head saddle. But it's a very fine example of a serpent head saddle made out of apricot wood and leather and well handcrafted brass appointments on it. But these saddles were made out of rebar left over from the Soviet era and pallet wood from, from shipping pallets. And I mean, they were pretty uncomfortable, weren't they, Dad? <laughs> and the Kyrgyz are, are built quite differently than us. They're, their calves are about that long and their thighs are about that long. So they're, everything's set up for, for somebody built. And they're excellent riders, but it yeah. was, I had to adjust my stirrups quite a bit just to not be in terrible now, pain. Now the old man who owned the horses, mm -hmm. I think he had a grandson with him yeah. and a son. Yeah. And then a couple of other people yeah. helping out. We, we, we were traveling like Victorian English lords, kind of. We had a whole troop of horsemen taking care of our horses and setting up camp, and we had a cook, cooking, and for an us. interpreter, and all that. It, it was I could get used to that. So yeah, it was pretty easy. It, it took a while for me to get used to when we got where we were going in the evening to sit down and just write in my journal and read a book and not worry about setting up camp or cooking. Was, I, yeah, yeah. We slept in a kind of a pup tent. Yeah, except one night, I forget what caused the problem, but. 
Is that picture there? Uh, it's coming. Okay. Uh, let's talk about that when the picture comes up. Um, so this, you see this scenery here. This is the mountains that we were riding into, and this is a heavily altered landscape. Um, of course, it's been occupied and grazed for millennia, but um, it, uh, this is all onions. The Soviets came in, the sheep, when the Soviets came in, they stopped the nomadic herding. They told all the nomads that they had to live in towns and they had certain places that they could run livestock on. And of course that just devastated the environment. So it got overgrazed just horribly. The grass died out, everything just really fell apart because the system was you took your animals, you grazed up into the mountains in the summer and down into the valleys in the winter and you moved your animals all year round. And all of a sudden the animals were locked down, the people were locked down and it really didn't work well. So the Soviets thought the only thing wrong was that the sheep were eating everything. So they planted onions because onions were the one thing that sheep wouldn't eat. And of course, they still ate everything else, but the onions took over. So there are thousands and thousands of acres of onions growing there. And most of the sheep have adapted to eating them somewhat now. So, but, yeah. but it smelled strongly of onion in that area. But, um, and they also did, the Soviets also did things like killed all the native fish out of lakes and brought in, you know, foreign fish and things like that that were really disruptive. But, um, and just keep rolling, Greg. There are more onions. This, this ride we were on, these are some glaciers we came on. So on this ride, we were never under 10,000 feet and we crossed a couple mountain passes that were over 14,000 feet. I mean, Colorado brags about its 12,000 foot mountains. Yeah. And we were over the two passes, passes that were 14,000. Yeah, feet. right there, our guide um, and interpreter there uh, is uh, waving. That's a little over 14,000 feet that he's sitting at, as, as a mot. He was our guide. He'd been an interpreter at uh, army bases in Afghanistan for years, so he spoke perfect English and was a wonderful resource on education. He was the, his seventh great grandfather had been the last king of Kyrgyzstan before the Russians deposed him and took over the country. So, How old was that old guy that owned all the horses? So that was one of the interesting things about our trip was everywhere we went, my dad was the oldest person there by far. Yeah, and I was in um, the later 70s at the time. And the senior horseman, Chermash, was in his 50s, which I'm 54 now, right, Gwen? I think. Um, and uh, he was in his late 50s at the time, and he was just crushed to find out that my dad was 78. So yeah. <laughs> he, he was used to being the senior person in the room. But the Kyrgyz used to be very long lived people, but they, um, when China pretty much took over after the Soviet Union, they pretty much owned all the livestock. And so they, the Kyrgyz diet changed from almost exclusively dairy and meat to being almost all processed cookies and candy and stuff. And they've, they've gone from living into their 90s regularly to living into their 60s and having diabetes and all the other problems of civilization. But, um, and so that's an Ibex skull there. That's the rigging on a saddle. The Ibex are the national animal they, uh, when we look at my saddle out there, I have a quirt made out of ibex horn. It's a mountain sheep, right? Yes, it's a mountain, sh uh, mountain sheep, not a goat. And they, uh, we found a lot of skulls because in the winter they die in avalanches a lot. They, of course, are really nimble and they live up high in the in the mountains. But, but we never saw a live ibex. We never saw a live ibex. Uh, do they have wolves? They have wolves. We didn't see any wild animals. Really. No, we saw very, very little wildlife. It's, it's a pretty devastated environment, um, post-Soviet Kyrgyzstan. They, a lot of it was wooded and forested. They clear-cut all the forests, and um, it's a heavily altered landscape. But, but they're adapting, and now that they've brought the, once the Soviets gave up on stopping the, the uh, migrations, uh, the grass is coming back. They're moving their their animals up and down the mountains again and in the valleys like they used to, and the grass is really coming back, and their their economy's pretty strong as far as livestock goes. Um, keep rolling. Um, so here's an example of a uh, yurt on the right. Uh, as we rode through this this ride, 
through this giant, kind of the center of Kyrgyzstan, we saw, at the time, we figured up, we had to have seen just, we kind of tried to keep count because we're ranchers, so we tried to keep count of how many cattle we saw and horses we saw and sheep and goats we saw. We gave up because we saw well over a million sheep and goats, well over 500,000 cattle and well over probably that many that horses many at horses. least. Yeah. And that might have been more than that. Time. It was just lots and lots of livestock. All of them taken care of by, by nomadic families. Uh, this is an example. You see all those are all sheep and goats there that you see behind the yurt. And at night, they bring the sheep and goats in to a very tight pen. And that's partly, uh, it concentrates their manure, which they then uh, harvest and sell as f cooking fuel for people in towns. But it also protects them because they have snow leopards, they have wolves, they have golden jackals, and they have e wild eagles that... that uh, would kill the sheep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so these families, the little kids on donkeys would take the sheep and goats up the mountains every day. Before daylight, they'd take them out. The, the adults would take the, cow, the cattle out and send them more on the lower slopes of the mountains. And the horses, they would stake the mares out and turn all the colts and, and studs and un, unbred mares loose to graze down, graze wherever they wanted pretty much. And then they milk the mares, and the, that's one of their the main foods of the nomads is is mares milk and uh, curdled milk, mares milk, uh, which is a slightly alcoholic fermented milk, milk like a yogurt, and then cheese that they make from it. Yeah. But um, they uh, seldom butcher animals. They did several times for us because it was you know a, an occasion but most of them don't own many of the animals so they don't eat eat much uh, meat anymore because they just don't own it and the Kyrgyz have a very strong honor system honor culture where they have stories about families starving to death looking after animals that belong to somebody else but their honor wouldn't allow them to you know butcher the animals they were looking after because to you know for food or sustenance yeah. so but um, those may be apocryphal, but they have the stories. We saw thousands and thousands and thousands of cattle, mm -hmm. sheep and goats, horses, and in that whole distance we rode, never saw a fence. Yeah. They did little pens near the yurt where they'd like, put, pin them up. Like that there, yeah. Little holding pens at night, but yeah. no fences, no two-track roads. We didn't see a vehicle. We didn't see a man-made light. We did. Toward the end, there was a, the a yurt end, that yeah. had a There was a, a cattle car buyer some in a, kind, in a yeah. vehicle and a, a man-made light, and it was shocking after five yeah. days of not seeing anything like that. The other thing we didn't see, there were no buildings. It was all, all yurts. The other thing we didn't see during that time were were uh, jet trails in the sky because it's a no-fly zone for because of Afghanistan, and yeah. so there's no airplanes in the sky at night or during the day either. And that was yeah. shockingly different than we were used to. It was, it was wonderful I mean, to see. How many of those can you see a day here? Oh, thousands. Dozens. Yeah. 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 But, there's uh, no, another example of night pens and the sheep on the hills, and. Uh, as we got deeper into the mountains, we saw more and more native vegetation. Um, it was somewhat jarring because the Soviets had introduced a lot of North American vegetation, and they considered things like big blue stem and lead plant and some of the plants that we really value here as invasive species there and undesirable. But like let, Serratia lespedeza, which is just absolute hell on earth here in the Flint Hills, is one of the most desired species they have there because it's, it stays palatable, it doesn't get woody like it does here, and everything there gobbles it up. They have trouble keeping serratia growing there, so, and they try to get rid of big blue stem. We need to import a few Kyrgyz yeah. cattle. <laughs> yeah, but it got prettier and prettier, and the deeper into the mountains we got, the less impact the Soviets had had. Um, there's good examples. There's the saddle that I rode most of the time. Uh, it was uncomfortable. <laughs> and it was Soviet era, so it was probably from the 1970s, made out of rebar and pallets. And uh, they, but they worked. I mean, I by the time I got done, I'd uh, made my own straps and adjusted my stirrups and made them fit a lot better. So, 
And here's an example of the horses, just gorgeous, high quality horses, beautiful horses. Um, most of these horses that were running wild were getting milked and then the, uh, the offspring were getting sold. And, and they own, the Kyrgyz owned a lot of their own horses and so we ate a lot of horse meat, a lot of donkey meat, um, delicious, but um, they didn't eat much mutton or beef. And uh, here's, a, I think this is the year that we, when we, uh, on our journey, one day was really windy and we'd been that why they couldn't put the tent up yeah they'd been there? trying to put the tent up for about an hour and some uh, nomads about five miles away had been watching with great mirth and uh, came over and offered to let us stay in the yurt with them so we got yeah. to stay in the it yurt and really that was amazing to stay yeah. in a real yurt with real yeah Kyrgyz people and not uh, yeah and the yurts are set up the half of it is for the man and half of it's for the woman you walk in the door to the right is the woman's part. And the the man's part has the hearth for heating, and the they have they all have uh, cupboards, big quilt cupboards that they keep all their linens and stuff in, and then the woman's part has the kitchen and the beds, and um, then there's everybody sits in the middle in a circle kind of. But it's very great, wonderful hospitality and. Yeah, that was one of the high points getting to say in. And stay in one of the real yes and groups. meeting and interacting with real uh yeah. nomads that are still Herders, yeah. herding animals for hundreds of miles through wild country it yeah. was it was amazing and that's just a lot of typical scenery uh, and they those dogs <clears throat> they those are hunting dogs they use them to uh, try to keep the jackals and wolves and uh, snow leopards at bay um very well behaved dogs, very big and hardy. They need to be. And uh, um, yeah, just keep rolling, Greg. This, we, we took a lot more pictures than this even, but <laughs> you can see it's very scenic. We kept saying we should have had Mark Fiden come with us just so he could photograph the whole thing. But Yeah. <laughs> and this is Azamat, our interpreter, talking to our hosts. At the yurts. The, the yurts. That was the uh, mare's milk that we were drinking there. It was surprisingly good. That is the junior horseman, the grandson of Chermash. Chermash is on the right, his son Abek on the left, and uh, uh, Janabek is the one sleeping on that horse there. That had our tents and stuff. And he would sleep on that horse. Uh, Lawler, he, yeah, he enjoyed himself quite a bit. So. And just keep rolling that uh, that peak back there in that last slide um, is uh, uh, oh no worries yeah the big peak there is called uh, uh, Khan Tingre and it's the highest peak in Kyrgyzstan it's it used to be Mount Lenin but they changed it to Khan Tigre which uh, is uh, their the Kyrgyz word for God for the mountain of God or King God yeah. Um, that's about the extent I did see dung beetles dung beetles are my favorite animal in the world and I did get to see dung beetles in Kyrgyzstan I'm really glad for that and uh, that was about the only wildlife we saw we saw some marmots and a kangaroo rat that's our, our cook uh, cooking in the yurt that night and that was the one vehicle we saw back there that um, the whole time that was the first time we'd seen a vehicle in five days yeah yeah the only one we saw. Only one we saw in that whole time. Right? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, except in the city. Until we came to this, and um, we rode through there. At the end of our big ride, we came to a super highway, and this is just two lanes of it. There's another two lanes, but the Chinese are building the belt road and belt system, and this is the portion that's going through Kyrgyzstan, and it's they're building. It's pretty much empty there's almost no traffic because it's not connected to anything yet but they're building segments at a time and they're building the easier segments first and then going through the mountain passes but they're getting ready they're connecting beijing to istanbul is the goal i think part of that those roads were on the old silk road yes so the the road the belt system that the chinese are building is basically just the old silk road and at this point we we're on the Silk Road for most of the rest of our journey. 
And, yeah, uh, not um, in the mountains, but once we got out into right, the countryside. Yeah. And from here, go ahead and roll, Greg. Um, oh, and there's uh, some people we met on the way. <laughs> and so we got to a uh, the caravan Sarai, which is a uh, was an old fortified trading post on the Silk Road, and um, <clears throat> this, this is where we got off our horses, unfortunately, and got in minivans, four-wheel drive Russian minivans, and um, went to the caravan Sarai. Uh, it was built. Uh, long before Genghis, but Genghis fortified them all and made them uh, much more safe and uh, held until the the Ottoman Empire fell. Most of those caravanserais were intact and, and functional until about then. But um, here's a yak and sheep and this, we, rode, we drove through a large part of the country you can see just gorgeous, pretty rough roads. That was pretty typical right there. <laughs> a lot of winding and stuff because it's rough country. Was that, was that headed up to a lake or something? Yeah, that's yeah. where we rode around a lake. And man, that was a winding road. This is on a shorter ride there. Um, just keep rolling on through this, Greg. And we came to the, the ancient Silk Road town of Nairn, which um, is a really old city. Uh, not much left of the city except for Soviet block style housing and stuff, but they have a huge animal market there. And so, um, you can keep rolling through these. Uh, the lot, you can see the horses and cattle and sheep. You see the sheep with the huge fat deposits on their tail. They really like mutton fat. Um, they even rub mutton fat on almost everything that you really don't want them to rub mutton fat on, then hand it to you to eat as a special treat. But um, yeah. That was really an experience seeing that market day. Yeah. Because they also had like trailers that would be hooked onto a semi or something that were filled with all kinds of livestock and well, oh, and all produce kinds of, and yeah, and, stuff. And, yeah, and it was a true yeah, it was uh, like a, a general store or something. Yeah, for, it was a, a real stuff, bazaar. Yeah. yeah, but um, the uh, oh, the and oh. what, excuse me, one other thing. Somebody had, I don't know, eight or ten horses for sale, mm -hmm. and he, there was a kind of elevator road to the south end of this market, and he kept running them back and forth there, getting people's attention to the horses. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yep. It was a lot like a horse sale here. Um, and so our next stop, we uh, oh. got to see, we got to visit with a, uh, a eagle hunter. And he was a professional eagle hunter. He, his family had been eagle hunters for at least seven generations. And it was fast. They use eagles. They, they catch eagles or hatch eagles and use them to defend their sheep. The, the eagle hunters will hire out to go uh, hunt golden jackals or juvenile wolves um, in areas to keep them from bothering sheep. Um, they have two ways of getting eagles. They climb the mountains and get a fledgling eagle out of the nest and take it home and raise it, or they climb the mountains and they get an egg out of the nest and hatch it and raise it. If the egg eagles only get to be about 12 pounds and they never get really big and they are not very good hunters, but fledgling eagles will get to be over 20 pounds, sometimes 18 to 22, I think they said, and um, are very good hunters but they only will stay with the person for a few years and then they'll release them and they'll become wild eagles. And this guy had two eagles. Yeah. They he, use female golden eagles for hunting. Yeah. And we each got to hold on our wrist an yeah. eagle, I'll tell you, 15, 16 pounds. I yeah. don't know how long that lasts. That's, that a, big, that's a big That's bird. bird. Yeah. yeah. But um, and he hunted rabbits just to demonstrate for us because it wasn't the season for anything else. Well, he brought else. a rabbit with him. Yeah, he brought a rabbit and released. And turned it, it loose, and yeah. the eagle swooped down and. Yeah. And he also had hunting dogs. Yeah. Corzoi hunting dogs. Yeah. And um. <clears throat> that, was, that was a real interesting highlight. I've seen those eagles and holding an eagle on your wrist. Yeah. And imagining them uh, catching a juvenile wolf or a golden jackal. Yeah. Impressive. <laughs> but um, our, our next, we got really lucky, and we went, the next 
place. We went to Karakol, which is another ancient city on the Silk Road, and it's on the Chinese border. And so it's right across from the part of China where the Uyghurs are, which the Uyghurs are a Muslim population in China that are getting... Yeah, the had, Chinese are really... Yeah, the Chinese had some concentration them, camps yeah. for them, re-education camps for them. So the Uyghurs in Kyrgyzstan are... Um, are seem very Chinese to the Kyrgyz, but are considered absolute foreigners in China, where most of their homeland is. But um, well, they have a very intact Uyghur culture in Kyrgyzstan still. And one night he had, our guide had set up a uh, dinner that night with uh, an Uyghur woman. Yeah, in a, uh, the home of a Uyghur family, and yeah. had traditional Uyghur cooking, and all it was amazing, very fun. Um, but in Caracol, we then were going to go stay at a agritourism, uh, basically a guest ranch. Like our, we called it the Kyrgyz Flying W because of our guest ranch here. And um, <clears throat> when we got there, beautiful place and lots of agri. That's a picture on the left. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, it's on the edge of the Pamir Gorge. So that's the Pamir Gorge. And this is a big tableland, and the Pamir Gorge is the eroded area that runs all the way th from the Pamir Mountains are on either side, and it runs into China. <clears throat> really fertile, really beautiful place. And um, that on the right is a picture of Oscar, and he is a uh, warlord. I, we didn't know that at the time, but he owns the, the agritourism place. And uh, when we got there, we... It was beautiful. We were really enjoying it. But he met, us, came and met us, and talked to us a bit through our interpreter. Very hospital. Very hospital, and insisted on taking us on a tour of his holdings. And so we spent two days touring his holdings, and everything. I mean, it was really impressive. Um, they, uh, you know, he imports farm machinery from Germany to do the farming. He raises mainly barley. Um, but also he imports uh, Angus cattle from Montana, horses from Texas and Kentucky, and um, had just, I mean, amazing livestock and, and sheep. They don't have to import sheep because they, as he said, they have the best sheep in the world. And they did. They had gorgeous sheep with lots of big fat deposits. So they, but being a warlord is a good deal. He, um, I actually, when we got there, I was, um, we had Wi-Fi for the first time on the trip, and we were just kind of curious about him. I looked him up, and it immediately came up. His name came up as Minor Warlord of the Pamir Gorge, and <laughs> he's on restriction. He can't travel in Europe or the U.S. and stuff, but, but you'd never know it. He was the former Secretary of Agriculture. Uh -huh. He's in the middle, so, yeah. But, um, yeah, he's the former Secretary of Agric Agriculture and Commerce for the former government of Kyrgyzstan that had been deposed. And as his parting gift, he gifted himself the Pamir Gorge, basically. So it's good to be king. I think they had the first uh, free election when we were there or just after he left. They had just so we, had the first free elections. Yeah. We credit ourselves with bringing yeah. democracy. Yeah, freedom to, and democracy to Kyrgyzstan. Um, and here, so while there, we had a wonderful time and wonderful food, all that, but um, they invited us to go to the Hippodrome, and uh, his son, Abek, uh, was, perform was competing in the races in Kuk Baru, which is the national game, and I'll explain that in a bit. And uh, so while there, we got to play with eagles again. They have an eagle tournament there during the, the horse games, the national horse games, where all the eagle... Uh, hunters from around the country come and they they have competitions of hunting rabbits and stuff but they also for the finale of the eagle festival they all release their older uh, fledgling birds at once and whoever's birds come back win prizes but most of the birds that's when they typically release them and they go back they disperse and go back into the wild and, and hunt on their own and some of them will come back to their to their hunters later years later but usually they don't but um that's that's Raina Kinch the Oscars uh, f uh Kyrgyz Flung W and this is where we heard some traditional mus musicians that also recited the Manus poem parts of the Man parts Manus of poem it. to it. yeah just not all half million acres or lines 
Through um, lines. And that's one of their sport horses that's a crossbreed between Kyrgyz blood and uh, Kentucky thoroughbreds. And that's Oscar on the left, and that's Abeck on the right. Uh, that's another national sport is wrestling on horseback, grappling on horseback. Uh, it takes a lot of skill. And then uh, the, they have a bride chase, bride race, which is a tr Kyrgyz tradition where a bride, get, if she has more than one suitor, can, has, can claim the right to race them. And if she beats them, she can quirt or whip the one the suitors she doesn't like away and then pick her suitor that she wants to marry. So it's, it's not actually very, it's more of a, a play at this point, but still. And then on, uh, back one more slide, I'm sorry, Greg. On the right is Kok Baru, that's the national game. And you may know it as Booz Kashi. Uh, that's what they call it in Afghanistan. I think it was in one of the- uh, and It's all over the, it's in the area, stuff. all those stands and- Yeah. Yeah, convicts down there all play this. It's their national or and, international sport. But the Kyrgyz say it started in Kyrgyzstan. Yeah. Um, it's played now with a headless, legless goat. They, they have a goat. Or calf. Or calf, but usually a goat. Um, and they, their, their shaman ritually slices its throat, guts it, sews it shut, and cuts its legs and head off. And then you have to, on horseback, reach down and pick up this 40, 50 pound goat and you, your team is anywhere from four to 500 people and the opposing team the same, and you try to carry it into the goal of the opposing team. It's very violent, very dangerous. They have ambulances and the military there to keep people from actually fighting. Yeah. But, um, the one yeah. we saw, it was uh, teams of, what were there, about eight or 10? About eight or 10, yeah, yeah. And they had to- From different regions. Yeah, carry this body yeah. Of this gun. We'd seen uh, north, we were watching horse races, and I noticed on the north end of this area to these was a goat tied up. <laughs> Next time we saw the goat, he was out ahead with yeah. his guts. Well, yeah. And they had, uh, they were carrying him. Uh, I forget, did they just throw him out there and the two teams have to fight? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And. But these were teams with only eight or ten people on the side. Yeah. And the real ones that they started, oh, sorry, the real ones they started years ago, there would be hundreds of people on each side. Basically mock warfare. Yeah. And it was one gutted animal, calf or a goat, and hundreds of people fighting for it. I mean, it was brutal. But the original cook brew was started by shepherds. And uh, they, if they saw a juvenile wolf in their sheep, the young, young kids would run and grab it by the scruff of the neck and carry it to their neighbor's yurt and throw it through the door <laughs> as just as a prank. And then that would escalate and they'd go back and forth. So that's how it all started. And um, it's still fun, but dangerous. Yeah. It was really, I'd read about that for years. I was really delighted to get yeah, to see well, that it. Yeah, we actually got to watch yes. it. And the military did break it up while we were there watching. So, <laughs> And that was, those are just examples of Oscar's cattle and horses that he's, and sheep. So, and that's it. That was our trip to Kyrgyzstan. Yeah. But we learned a lot. Thank you. And I guess it's okay if we do questions. Anybody? The question was, uh, since the, the Kyrgyz don't own the, the sheep and the cattle and stuff, who owns them? Most, some is, Chinese, or is Russian owned, but most are uh, Chinese owned interests. The Chinese investors own big herds of animals and then farm them out to the different shepherds that take care of them. And, mm-hmm. Uh, the question was what, how, what our route was to get there. Uh, we went through Istanbul. That was the easiest way. You can go through Moscow, but it was easier. to. We, you have to have permits and stuff for that. Istanbul, we could just, with a passport. So. Did you have to spend time in there for Istanbul? Nope. Yeah, it, my dad said the Istanbul airport is a very pleasant place to be. So. Do they practice Islam? So that is another Kyrgyz saying, that they are just Islamic enough that their neighbors leave them alone. That 
there are mosques everywhere that are, are but nobody in them. Um, they they are animists. They uh, they're traditional religion. So do do they sell their livestock back? Then goes back to China or Russia? Most of it's exported to China or Russia. Yeah, but and in the cities, they you know they consume beef there and stuff. But oh gosh, um, yeah, about six million, and it's this. Yeah, and most of that's con concentrated in uh, three cities. So, but six million people in something the size of Nebraska. As aside from uh, meat, uh, what was the, the the rest of the food like? Like, what kind of spices do they use? And stuff? Good question. Yeah, um, the food was wonderful. I mean, I unfortunately got. Uh, sick on the plane ride over and I got food poisoning the first night we were there from the hotel food and so the first couple of days on our journey I was basically rolling around on the ground in piles of donkey poop and uh, moaning <laughs> it was pretty miserable but I got over that pretty quick and the uh, food we had our cook was a Russian uh, cook and um, they they had actually butchered a lamb for us instead of an, a ewe, which was nice to have mutton or lamb instead of mutton. But we ate a lot of mutton as well. Uh, but a lot of horse and donkey sausage, uh, a lot of that gets made into sausage. That was delicious. Um, we had stew made out of horse a couple times. Um, lots of dill, lots of cucumbers, and the best watermelon and cantaloupe. You've, they, watermelon and cantaloupe are from that area. And the watermelon cantaloupe there, I've never tasted as good a watermelon and cantaloupe. It was delicious. And plums and apples, all kinds of stuff. What did the, uh, the horse uh, milk cheese taste like? Um, it tasted like yogurt that had kind of gone off with a little bit of vodka in it. So <laughs> that was one other part of the trip. Um, everywhere we went, partly because of my dad's seniority, people would offer us vodka. And my dad refused most of it, so I had to drink it for guest rights. And it was the most vodka I've drunk in my entire life, and I did not enjoy it. So it was like turpentine. And Dad didn't eat the cheese or the mare's milk either, but you did try the, the kumis, the, the fermented mare's milk. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the urban populations have very good literacy, good education. The rural populations less so. But um, uh, there's their big concern of the rural people, like the nomadic herders, is um, they have a lot of German tourists, and and when they when they're done on their tour, they leave the the dirt bikes there for the kids, and so a lot of the kids leave and go to the city with dirt bikes instead of staying and enjoying the nomadic lifestyle. So their their population is dwindling and becoming more urban. So that's uh, but there's they have a strong culture, so they they're surviving. Mm -hmm. Uh, the question was, how were we received as Americans? Uh, very friendly. I mean, you could have walked through anywhere in the country of Kyrgyzstan with $100 bills hanging out your back pocket, and you wouldn't have been robbed. I mean, it was very safe, very friendly, um, uh, very positive towards Americans. The warlord especially. The warlord especially, because he deals, you know, he buys things from America. But... Um, like our interpreter had been an uh, interpreter for the army in Afghanistan. Uh, a lot of people had, had been contract workers in Afghanistan, so they had very positive, you know, they raised their standard of living, having some income and stuff. So. And there's a military, a U.S. military base, one of the only ones in the area in Kyrgyzstan. So it's there. Oh, boy. Um, conversion rate for money. We didn't have to spend any money on our horses. Yeah, <laughs> there's no place to spend cash. <laughs> no, they didn't do that. But um, I think it was obols, right? I think it was obols, and I think it was like 24 obols to a dollar at the time. But things were relatively inexpensive for us. The, the dollar was strong.
Anything else? All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. Yeah. Turn it around. Mm -hmm. They didn't do it very well.